Hello, very good morning to everyone. I thank the organizers for this opportunity. Um, well begun is half done, but as surgeons, we would uh, believe that well diagnosed is half treated. So in this background, let's look at some radiological evaluation and spinal infections from the perspective of a spine surgeon. There are lots of there's lots and lots written in the textbook by radiologists, but let's see as what we as spine surgeons would be interested to look out for whenever we are evaluating spinal infections. X-rays, of course, is the mainstay of in, you know, investigations in these kind of situations. And uh, the only drawback is that most of the times the changes in X-rays would happen only after a lag period. And hence, they may not be among the foremost modalities to pick up early infection, but in a later stage, we would see changes like end plate erosions as is seen over here. Uh, there are also certain other uh, features which we can see on the X-rays. Uh, there is this bird's nest appearance as we can see on the anteroposterior X-ray over here and which would be indicative of a paraspinal abscess and which may probably require a surgical intervention as is seen over here. Um, beyond that, we are more keenly interested in looking, not just we are orthopedic surgeons and we tend to look more at the bones, but beyond the bones, we also need to look at the soft tissue. Now here is a illustrative case where the soft tissue shadow has increased in the anterior aspect of the cervical spine. And when we do an MRI, we realize that there is a pre-vertebral abscess, which uh, you know is causing a mass effect and had to be drained. And uh, that was because of a small lesion in the C2, an exudative cox type of lesion, and uh, which was drained and which led to a satisfactory outcome at the end of treatment. One can see the normalization of the soft tissue shadow at that level. We are also interested in looking at features of instability in the spine. And this is something which I believe most of us are aware about and that is the presence of spine at risk signs in pediatric spinal tuberculosis. There are four signs and of the four, three are seen on the lateral X-ray and are seen in this particular illustrative case, the toppling over, posterior translation and the facetal disruption. The fourth sign that is the lateral translation is seen on the anteroposterior X-ray. So this is the MRI of this particular patient and had to be operated upon with a hybrid fixation as is seen over here. Sometimes we also see anterior tuberculosis with anterior abscess and that may present with scalloping of the anterior cortex. Just zooming out the lateral view and we can see that there is scalloping of the anterior cortex over here, which is because of the erosion due to the anterior abscess. We, as mentioned before, we also use X-rays as uh, primarily since we are surgeons, we would want to evaluate instability. And here is a patient who had features of post-operative infection at the L5-S1 level. And uh, there was significant osteolysis uh, before the start of the treatment. At the end of the treatment, the CT scan did show a uh, good amount of resolution of the bone defect, but still, you know, not adequate enough for us to make a decision whether the spine is stable or not. And in these situations, we often resort to flexion extension x-rays to actually clarify whether the patient's spine is stable or not. Um, beyond de novo infections, we would also want to look out for infections, signs of infections in post-operative cases of ours. And in these situations, we may have to look out for subtle indicators of infection, such as lucencies around the screws, as is seen over here. To summarize, X-rays are used uh, in as the one of the most basic investigations. Uh, one can look out for in plate erosions, and it's not just the bones. We also need to look at the soft tissue shadows. We also look out for features of instability. And it's a very important investigation for follow-up of treatment. We also look for features of post-operative infection whenever necessary. Coming to the next modality, that is MRI. This is something which is very popular, uh, commonplace and universally available now in practically all parts of India. Uh, there are various features that you would want to look out for in the MRI, abscess, extent of lesion, as well as the status of the cord as is seen over here. 
we would also want to go beyond just looking at the lesion the main lesion we would also want to look out for skip lesions and for this stir imaging of the whole spine is very useful here is an illustrative case a patient with skip lesions at three levels and of these three levels the thoracic and the lumbar spine levels were uh, showing instability and hence had to be operated upon as is seen over here Uh, we would also want to look out for spinal cord changes or presence of intramedullary tuberculoma uh, we are more focused on discussing tuberculosis because that is the most common spinal infection that we would be visualizing uh, of course there are other infections also but a major part of our discussion is going to uh, focus on tuberculosis so this is a patient who had intramedullary tuberculoma and uh, before treatment and after treatment with uh, steroids and antituberculous treatment uh, we had a satisfactory outcome for this particular patient there are also certain telltale signs which will tell us to different which will differentiate the tuberculosis from pyogenic infection on mri here is a wonderful literature for that and just a synopsis of this literature whenever we do a contrast mri in tb there will be heterogeneous enhancement of the vertebral body vertebral intraosseous abscess will be there and there will be paraspinal abscess as against that in pyogenic we would see homogeneous enhancement of the vertebral body disc abscess and uh, that is how we will be able to differentiate between the tuberculosis and the pyogenic infection the other indications of mri is to identify the healing response now this is a MRI, which was present before the treatment was started, and one can see the cold abscess there, and where there is resolution of the cold abscess following non-operative treatment, as is seen over here. One would also want to look out for signal intensity changes before treatment and after treatment. And one of the foremost indicators of heel infection is the presence of hyper intensities on T1 weighted images, which indicates that. the infected marrow is now replaced by fatty marrow and hence it's a sign of healing um there are of course other indications for mri to evaluate post operative spine infections and these would be better evaluated on uh, t2 weighted images now here's an illustrative case a patient operated upon for l45 discectomy presented with pain thereafter and uh, we had Uh, when we did the mri there was evidence of hyper intensity on t2 weighted images at the level of the disc space indicative of infection and the patient had to be taken up for appropriate surgery accordingly there are additional utilities of mri as is seen over here in this particular illustrative case uh, we can see that uh, there is a uh, infectious lesion in the subaxial spine and here is the axial section and we can see that there is a large abscess which is slightly asymmetrical and it's also engulfing the vertebral artery so in these kind of situations one may utilize the mri to do mr angiogram to evaluate the vertebral artery status and once confirmed that it's all okay we can go ahead with our inter uh, uh, operative intervention as is seen over here however there is a word of caution that we need to have on mri Though MRI is diagnostic in most cases, there are some TB cases which may mimic neoplasms, as is seen over here, and vice versa. Some neoplasms may mimic tuberculosis, as is seen over here. This may otherwise look like a tuberculous lesion, but it's actually a metastasis from the lung carcinoma. So sometimes there is an overestimation of the problem on MRI. Now here is an illustrative case: the presentation X-ray. we should see no case but we see the mri it looks quite ghastly and uh, however we were aware about this phenomenon of overestimation of problem in the mri the patient was given non operative treatment and following simple conservative treatment we had a satisfactory outcome without the need for any kind of major surgical intervention so to summarize um uh, MRI is uh, useful for confirming diagnosis for evaluating the cord status to identify skip lesions and to differentiate between pyogenic versus tuberculous lesions to evaluate the healing response as well 
It may also give us ancillary information in the form of status of vertebral artery and other details which may be useful in planning the treatment. Coming to CT scan, it's used primarily to assess stability. Uh, as spine surgeons, this is what we are interested in looking out for. Here is an illustrative case, a patient with a mid-lumbar lesion. There is some amount of collapse of the disc space. MRI looks okay. But when we do a CT scan, here is what we see. There is a significant osteolysis. One side facet is totally destroyed. And definitely, this qualifies to be an unstable lesion and hence was operated upon. The patient was also severely symptomatic, not able to move around even in the bed, could not turn around in the bed and hence had to be taken up for intervention. So this kind of decision making is possible only if we take judiciously utilize uh, CT scans in the evaluation of these kind of lesions. It allows us, as mentioned, it allows us to define the extent of osteolysis. Again, a subaxial lesion, we can see that there is some involvement in the MRI, but a CT scan obviously shows a large defect anteriorly, which cannot be managed with non-operative treatment, and hence a surgical intervention was essential. It can also obviously help us, a CT-guided biopsy can also be a um, useful modality in investigating for uh, the, in, in, in the setting of spinal infection. So this is an illustrative case with uh, hyperintensity seen in the SI joint taken up for CT-guided biopsy and accordingly appropriate treatment was carried out. CT is also obviously useful for evaluation of junctional areas. Here is a cervicothoracic tuberculosis patient who was operated upon with an anterior plus posterior fixation. So to summarize, CT scan is useful for diagnosing instability, for percutaneous biopsy, and to assess junctional areas. There are a lot of other tests which have also been listed out, which I'm just listing out for the sake of completion, the use of bone scan. Some of these scans can give us the information related to infection even within 48 hours. PET CT, though it is uh, documented to be a useful investigation modality, but it's not very frequently used because of the cost constraints and the availability constraints. But yes, it can be used for diagnosis, but more so for follow-up of these kind of problems. There are other newer modalities on the horizon, such as diffusion tensor, tensor imaging. However, there have not been many promising results out of this thing, and hence it's not really very useful. So the take-home message is that radiological investigations in the, in the management of uh, spinal infections are directed towards diagnosis, evaluation of instability, planning the management, and monitoring response to treatment. Thank you very much for your attention.